All right, so guys, today's Friday and we have to cover a lot of news actually. So let's start with the biggest one of them all, which is yesterday. I'm pretty sure everyone saw the Dow Jones, the S&P, NASDAQ, everything down. Okay, Dow Jones down by a thousand points. NASDAQ down by 5%. Something crazy was happening yesterday. Okay, so I'm going gonna, gonna to just basically let you guys know uh, my train of thought of what's actually happening in the market uh, completely. And I'm not going to lie, I am a little bit happy because I kind of expected that to happen. But it was a lot more than what I expected it to be. So, uh, never, nevertheless, let's cover some news today. Mm. All right. So, first up, uh, we have a growth stock at just the lower. Uh, and I think this happens for everything. Okay. Uh, it doesn't matter your growth stocks. It doesn't matter if your tech stocks. It doesn't matter if you are in value stocks. Whatever it is. Okay. Everything went down. Okay. Just that growth and tech stock basically went down even more. Okay. Even Tesla. Okay. Something like Tesla went up 8%. 8% in the intraday um, last, uh, yesterday. So it was pretty crazy. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, I think that uh, with the whole entire market being like that, it, it's a little bit concerning to a certain extent, uh, of course. Uh, but, you know, this is why I always say, you know, hedge your position. Okay, you should always hedge your position. And I've been saying this um, since... I think March, no, um, February. I've been seeing this, uh, saying this since February because I've been saying it because I think that a recession is coming. And chances are, a recession is not going to be coming in the next two years. It's coming in this two years, okay? I'm expecting the recession to be coming in 2022, maybe 2023, uh, maybe 2023 but definitely before 2024 even it shows up. We're definitely going to be having a recession here. So, the reason why I'm actually thinking that a recession would definitely be happening is because, first of all, just look at China, okay? China is basically in recession at the moment, okay? Right after what happened with Evergrande, basically they've just been going downhill, okay? Evergrande just basically tipped everything downwards and then they just kind of imploded, okay? Look at Alibaba, okay? Down, what, like 70% from its all-time high? Uh, and it didn't even take 52 weeks. That's crazy. Okay. Uh, look at uh, like Pintodo. Look at Didi, which is basically getting delisted. Uh, you can look at JD.com. Uh, you can look at um, Futu. Uh, any, anything that is the Chinese stocks, all of them getting pummeled. And chances are, I do like to believe that uh, the Chinese stocks is basically kind of in somewhat of like a recessionary state uh, to begin with. And that's kind of like my main concern for China. Okay. And of course, um, ultimately, we do hope that, you know, the U.S., you know, because we do uh, invest in the U.S. market, I do hope that uh, the U.S. is going to find a soft landing somehow, uh, but it's definitely going to be very, very tough, okay, even looking at Singapore right now, okay, Singapore in our indexes, I think the index just closed not long ago, yeah, okay, the index just closed, and, you know, STI, uh, which is the Shrieks Time Index, is down 50, uh, 51 points, oh my gosh, down 51 points, about 1.55%. Uh, down 1.55% for our index fund themselves. So uh, definitely a little bit concerning um, for everyone because, and of course, this is due to the fact that, you know, the Dow just lost 1,000 points. The Dow losing 1,000 points is enough to scare a lot of people away. Okay, but let's get to the nitty-gritty of things, okay? So I'm pretty sure that if you guys have, well, if you guys have not watched my video on my expectation and what happened, the whole summary of the FOMC, you can check it out on my channel, okay? Uh, in the summary video, basically, I said about all the good things that um, was what Jerome Powell basically said, okay? But in all the goods, there's always some bad in, in, in between it, okay? You have to read between the lines, okay? First of all, we have to talk about the whole, uh, you know, 50 basis point hike is going to be present for the next couple of meetings, aka now we are expecting next couple of meetings, aka 50 basis point hike for this current meeting. Two more meetings later, that means there's going to be 50-50. In, and that simply means that in this three meeting alone, we are going to be increasing by 150 basis points, okay? Our end goal is to hit 2%, aka 200 basis point. okay? And right now, we are at 0 0.9, aka if the next two meeting alone, we are going to be hitting 50-50, okay? We are going to hit 1.9%. And if we hit 1.9% by the, um, well, two meetings later on, there's still going to be uh, three more meetings, Okay? There's still going to be three more meetings afterwards. And that three meetings, we are not sure if it's going to be 50 basis point high either. Okay? So if in the leftover three meetings, hopefully we get a 25 
uh, basis point hike instead. If those become any one of those become a 50 basis point hike, it simply means that we are going to be kind of having a sort of a, like a leading indicator to uh, how the inflation rate is actually going to be going. So that's kind of the, that's one of the main reasons why it's starting to be a little bit more concerning. Okay. Recession, recessionary fear, of course. Okay. And that's one of the, one of the huge reason why, okay, as much as the whole uh, FOMC summary, as much as uh, Jerome Powell came out and just be like, you know, he was great. He was confident. He showed us all the, the uh, he showed us that, you know, don't worry about it. You know, the feds have all the tools, but of course, when people start to really reassess what was actually being said in the meeting, people actually started to pan down what's going to be happening in the next few months. People realized that, first of all, can we even trust Jerome Powell? Personally, I do trust Jerome Powell. And, but like I said before, I do think that I am a very, very young investor. I just came into the market like about three years ago, or what, four years ago. I don't think I am in the correct mind to say that, yeah, you know, Jerome Powell is definitely going to be right. I don't think that's going to be the, I don't think that's the correct mentality to actually take it. Okay. So I believe that, of course, there are people who are, you know, fund managers, people who are institutional investors and such, and people who are in the market for the past decade or two, people who have, who have seen three uh, recessions or four recessions uh, do even come by. So I do believe that those people maybe to a certain extent have the emotional experience more than I do, okay? And those people are the ones that is kind of like panning down the FOMC summary and thinking like, that doesn't really make sense, okay? Jerome Powell most likely cannot find a soft landing, okay? And it's the same thing. You have to look at China. You look at India, okay? They are also going through the same exact concerns, okay? And that's what I'm saying. Okay, recession is definitely going to be happening. I don't think there's going to be anything that's going to stop it unless if, you know, suddenly there's going to be someone who just be like, all right, prices are all going to be stable. Someone has to be the instigator where they just kind of um, solidify the prices. Someone have to lose a lot, okay? You need a Jesus, basically, uh, which I don't think is going to be happening in the capitalistic world. All right, so anyway... That's one of the reasons why we basically like go, went down so much. Uh, over here, they actually talk about the pandemic darlings. Okay, honestly speaking, other than oil, everything went down. Other than oil and the VIX, which is the volatility index, nothing went up basically in uh, in yesterday's market. Um, I, I, I didn't really stay awake for the entire market uh, open. I think I fell asleep at about 2 a.m. I was really, really tired. I did not really have enough sleep the night before either. Um, so I did kind of read up a little bit uh, via some of the um, CBC um, news articles and such that I was listening on my way to work. Uh, and I realized, you know, like other than VIX and oil, everything else went down. Okay. And I'll talk a little bit more about the oil prices as well, because there's going to be another article that's going to be one of a triggering possibility of why oil prices might even go higher. Okay. So over here, you can see Zillow, a pandemic darling, drops 10% in the pre-market. So now we're actually entering into uh, recessionary fears for the housing market as well. Because Zillow, well, you know, Zillow back in uh, pandemic time, you know, people love real estate. Okay, but let's not forget, uh, besides Zillow as the pandemic darling, we have to think about the others. Okay, we have to think about retail, we have to think about e-commerce. Okay, e-commerce. Etsy and eBay just came out with their um, earnings and they were trash, okay? And that kind of brought forth even more fear because Spotify went down 15%, okay? It brought even Amazon down by 5% or something ridiculous, okay? And then we have to really look into the retail side of things, okay? Your Bed Bath & Beyond, um, your Crocs, your... All the retail stocks basically just went crazy bonkers downwards, okay? Because retail stock realized that Retail is not, not doing super duper well either, okay? E-commerce is not doing well. Retail is not doing particularly well either, okay? And now, with Zillow, a pandemic darling for the real estate side of things. And of course, you know, we, we understand that Zillow did a few bad mistakes uh, in the past few quarters. Uh, but, you know, nevertheless, we have to actually treat Zillow as a very, very serious company that deals with real estate, okay? And when Zillow deals with real estate and they are basically dropping 10% in the pre-market, Okay, it's scary enough, okay, because they have a very, very bad report, okay, and later on, at about 8.30 or 9.30 for us, um, no, uh, yeah, 8.30, 
uh, one hour before um, the market open, we are going to be getting the jobs report as well. And that's going to be another big catalyst for us as well. Because think about it, if the jobs report comes out, right now we are expecting us to actually return back to the pre-pandemic low for unemployment. Okay, and if that jobs report basically just shows us that you know unemployment is still a um, stifling issue that the Feds have not really solved, that is going to cause the market to inch down even more, and that's going to be my fear as well. Okay, and that's why I and later on I'm going to be going through my entire weekly trade, and you kind of understand where my mindset is at. Okay, but anyway, I'm going to continue on because I think that I've already spent too much time on this, and I need to go off very soon. Okay, Bitcoin stabilizes after Thursday sell-off. Bitcoin basically dropped by 8%. Like I said before, I'm going to be making a video on uh, Bitcoin cryptocurrency as a whole um, for tomorrow's video. I'm not sure how long it's going to be. I have not recorded it yet. I'm very, very busy lately, but I'm going to get that video out for by tomorrow. Okay, next up, we move on to the fear gauge. Uh, shooting higher after Wall Street sell-off. I'm pretty sure that we, uh, we already kind of uh, talked about this a little bit. All right, gaps between Italian and German bond yields hit widest in two years. Okay, cool. Um, signaling for the... Okay, cool. All right, ne next up, we have a US job growth was 30 in April, economy said. Okay, and of course, this is... Um, nothing is confirmed for the job growth because, like I said before, we need to wait until 8.30 before we get a jobs report. Okay, so this is going to be nullified for now. All right, let's move on. Elon Musk gets $7 billion in fresh a financing for the Twitter deal, which is a Saudi prince, Larry Ellison, and a Bitcoin exchange are among 19 investors joining in on Tesla CEO's bid. All right, so uh, the new money will cut in half the amount uh, Elon Musk needs to borrow against his Tesla stake, according to a regulatory filing, and will slightly reduce the balance of the cash he needs to put up personally uh, to just under $20 billion. And of course, if you guys did not really realize that yesterday, there was a breaking news, whereas that um, Elon Musk is going to be the temporary CEO of uh, Twitter, and which is why it was causing a huge ruckus. And for people who do not know, um, that you know, basically you're, you're, um, you're not allowed to be a CEO of two public company because of, well, clearly you have, um, yeah, you know, the point of contention where uh, you might have, um, different liability from your different uh, companies and such. Um, and because of that, uh, for that, you know, Elon Musk being uh, the CEO of Tesla and also the CEO of um, Twitter for a temporary time. And of course, you know, uh, for him being the CEO of um, SpaceX and also the boring company as well. So that's going to be a little bit of things for us to really think about as well. But right now, you also have to understand that this deal is not going to completely go through. Okay, there is a possible chance that this deal do not go through. Okay, it could be the SEC, it could be the White House, it could be Biden administration, whoever it is, they can come in and just say, all right, we do not allow this to happen. You know, this is going to be antitrust situation, this is going to be monopolizing a situation, whatever it is. Okay, and if that were to happen, they will break through. Elon Musk lose a couple of million dollars uh, for him to actually, uh, I, think it's a, I think it was like a I think it will actually go towards billion of dollars, but yeah, whatever it is, uh, that that's kind of the the thing around it. All right, the biggest contribution comes from Prince Al Walid bin Tala of Saudi Arabia, who agreed to retain a stake in Twitter valued at one point nine billion dollars following Mr. Musk take over. Um, the the prince, a nephew of King Salam, uh, Salman, uh, initially dismissed Mr. Musk's offer, saying it undervalued uh, Twitter. Uh, at his uh, desert camp outside of uh, Riyadh on Thursday and unable to comment. Uh, Papa Ellison, a co-founder of Oracle, agreed to put up um, $1 billion. Uh, Binance um, also uh, promised $500 million. Sequoia, Sequoia uh, Capital, uh, contributing $800 million and $400 million. Uh, oh, $400 million by uh, Andreessen. Uh, cool. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, but yeah, this is going to be one of the biggest, this, this is the one of the reason why this is one of the biggest news uh, there is for a um, M&A, uh, a merger and acquisition, because we are not expecting this to be the case at all. <laughs> all right, so uh, next up, Peloton, six minority investment to shore up business. Uh, the fitness company is pursuing potential investor that could take stake of around 15 to 20%. Uh, kind of kind of sad to see Peloton actually coming to this state, because let's be honest, uh, we had... Um, rumors about Amazon buying Peloton, Google buying Peloton, uh, even to a certain extent, I think Nike was thinking about buying Peloton as well. So I'm a little bit upset to really see that Peloton is just going down, 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 down. And, you know, the new CEO basically said, nah, you know what? We're going to fix the company. 
We are not going to be selling the company. And now basically coming out to say, you know, maybe if anyone uh, invests in Peloton, you can do so up to 20%. Uh, kind of feel like a shot tank episode, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but anyway, um, taking a stake of around 15 to 20%, according to people familiar with the matter, um, a discussion at a, an early stage, and there are no guarantees the New York-based company will find a taker or agree to a deal. Okay, I think that because, okay, ultimately this is also a Wall Street Journal uh, exclusive. So I'm not sure um, to what extent. Uh, however, yeah, I'm basically thinking that they're just kind of asking for, um, kind of just putting out in public, saying that they are really looking for investors. But honestly, right now, I don't think that Peloton is really that good of a company to really own, um, despite myself do having uh, 100 shares of Peloton uh, after the, call, uh, the cover call that I had, basically. No, the cover put that I have um, making me the proud owner of 100 shares of Peloton. But, you know, nevertheless, I still have Peloton and I would not I would not encourage anyone to buy Peloton, even though I do have stake in Peloton. Okay, do not buy Peloton. I think that Peloton is a bad company right now, especially with uh, the amount of headwinds that the company has. I don't think that it is good. Uh, stay away, stay away, stay away. Uh, all right, next up we have... Ba, 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 ba. Okay. Next thing we have CNBC. Okay, all our war on Ukraine. Putin could be gearing up for something big on May 9th. May 9th is Victory Day in Russia, marking the anniversary of the then Soviet Union's defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II. So, yes, I do think that, you know, uh, ultimately, not just Russia, I think Putin is also someone who is uh, quite emotional. And I think that May 9th could actually be something scary for us. Uh, and of course, May 9th is going to be Monday. It's going to be on Monday. So uh, I do think that today, especially today, like I said before, I say this multiple times, okay? I say this every single Friday. Do not hold your stocks if you are not 100% convicted to the stocks, okay? Friday is the time where you are going to see a lot of uh, volatility and that is the reason why that you have to really be worried about it, okay? So Monday, chances are Monday, um, when the whole victory day actually happened, if... The, you know, if Russia decides to be like, oh, you know what, we're just, we're gonna increase our attack on Ukraine, we're gonna increase our exposure to the main capital, Kiev, uh, and these kind of things can happen. And if that those things do eventually happen, that's gonna be causing a lot of ruckus, and that's kind of why we are so worried about it. Uh, so yeah, just take note of this. May night is Victory Day. Uh, if you can, I'm not sure if you really want to be hedging either because the things that. Uh, right now, the market is really, really, really low as it is. I'm not sure if, if, if it is really a good time for you to really find a hedging uh, mechanic over here. Uh, I do think that, you know, finding a hedging mechanism somewhere in the higher region would be a lot better. Like the day before yesterday, that was one of the best day that I can do my hedging mechanism. And I'm very, very happy I did it at about, uh, I think I did it about like 3.30, 3.30 a.m. Really love it. Like I said, I'll go through the weekly tricks later on. All right, next up, uh, we have, uh, let's see. Okay, we have China danger strikes fear into global investors stumbling on a Fed. Uh, the toxic combination of a slowing economy in China and what may be the most aggressive withdrawal of the Federal Reserve stimulus since 1994 is hammering the world's financial markets. Um, the economy was barely mentioned at a meeting. Uh, investors are growing uh, incre increasingly nervous. The CSI Treasury Index of the stocks fell 2.5% on Friday, taking losses this year to 21%. Um, at a meeting this week led by President Xi Jinping, the uh, Politburo uh, Seven Member Standing Committee said China will exhaust all means and effort to eradicate uh, COVID-19. Honestly speaking, I do think that this is a very, uh, not the best, not the best, okay? Uh, criticism of a cease a COVID zero strategy would not be tolerated was the stern message. I am I am sorry. I am truly sorry. <laughs> Vows to support the economy were uh, absent from the memo, raising questions over the five point five percent economic growth target. Uh, yeah, okay. I I honestly do not think that uh, China is going to hit the five point five percent economic growth target. Um, I think four point five percent maybe. Uh, but 5.5%, I think that's way too much. And like I said before, I do think that China is possibly in a recessionary trend. Most likely because recession is a lagging indicator after all. So I do think that, you know, China might be already be in a recession. We just haven't gotten the GDP to prove it yet. So, yeah, my thought. 
All right, next up, uh, we have, oh, the final one. Okay, cool. The final one, Bitcoin drops 8% as $126 billion is wiped off uh, the cryptocurrency market. All right, same thing. I'm going to be explaining this in tomorrow's video. So thankfully, this is the last news. So yeah, anyway, that's all I have for today. Oh, no, no, no. weekly news. Love this. Okay, uh, let's talk about my transaction, transactions. Okay, Um Honestly speaking, I didn't really buy anything new because, uh, like I said, the market was um, a little bit, you know, um, I didn't really sell much. I didn't really buy much. However, I did move a lot of my options, my uh, my money yielding, uh, my premium yielding options around. All right. So first up, uh, I got my, I did a lot of covered calls, um, whereas uh, this, the, all these covered calls was, uh, I think, about on Tuesday where I did all the covered calls. And then yesterday, no, uh, on Wednesday, I closed off all my covered calls at about 2.30 a.m. Oh, no, at uh, 2.24 a.m. At 2.24 a.m., I closed off all of my covered calls, where, where, which is why we saw the dip of the market. And afterwards, when we go all the way to the moon, okay, all the way to the moon, I started to cover, to do all my covered calls. And all this, uh, these are for all the stocks that I'm doing it for, okay? Snapchat, Lemonade, uh, Peloton, a, a SoFi, Twitter, um, Ford Motors, and Hippo Holdings. So these are the ones that I basically, oh, and Palantir, yeah. So these are the ones that I basically kept on I kept on drilling it to you guys, you know. It's important for you to guys to hatch, find a good day for you to get out, and then hatch again, okay? On down days, you want to get out, and then on good days, you want to hatch. That's kind of my, um, this, this is kind of what I'm doing. Of course, um, with the additional money that I do have, I kind of put it into riskier place, and then ultimately, those money might also be lost, but those money are the one that most likely will go, those are the money that I, I'm trying to go for the four, five, six X, uh, whereas like this kind of like premium yielding money, I kind of just let it hold at like <coughs> $3,000 a month, $4,000 a month. That's kind of like my whole uh, threshold of what I'm actually doing for uh, all my trades. But anyway, that's all I have for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys tomorrow.